Welcome everybody. Uh, this is our panel about the state of the art for enabling performance sensitive workloads and what we need to do in the uh, future. And this panel is about how different companies and different participants are working together uh, in the Kubernetes ecosystem to enable uh, the running of performance sensitive workloads in, in, in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And uh, I would like to ask our, our panelists to, to explain uh, who are they, of course, which companies are they coming from and what is their motivation to, to participate in this work? Swati? Hi, everyone. My, I'm Swati and I'm based in Ireland. I work as a principal software engineer in the ecosystem engineering group at Red Hat. My team and I have been focusing on enhancing Kubernetes and OpenShift to enhance um, and enable our customers and partners to run performance sensitive next generation workloads on Kubernetes. The primary use case that we've been looking at is how to make the Kubernetes scheduler topology aware. The performance sensitive critical workloads um, in the industries like telco, 5G, machine learning, artificial intelligence, high performance computing, they require resources such as CPUs, memory devices to be allocated such that they have access to the same local memory. And essentially that leads to optimum performance. Topology Manager, which is a Kubelet component, was introduced for topology alignment of requested resources at a node level. But scheduler's lack of knowledge for um, of the underlying topology, it can lead to suboptimal placement of workloads, and we are trying to solve this problem. Thank you, uh, Sasha. Hello, I'm Alexander Kanievsky, or well, some people call me Sasha. Uh, I'm cloud software architect. I work for Intel, and uh, I'm part of a team who are looking at resource management topics in Kubernetes and in CNCF infrastructure. As we are com a hardware company, obviously we have a good knowledge of how to optimize the workload to get the best uh, out of uh, available hardware. And our team is working on enabling different pieces in something in Kubernetes, something in runtime, something in add-on projects. And our goal is to uh, give a possibility to, to utilize hardware 100% for all your needs, for all your demands. Thank you very much. Cliff? Hi, my name is Cliff Burdick. I work at uh, NVIDIA as a dev tech engineer. Um, currently, I do optimization on GPU code and uh, kind of working on the input and output of GPUs from a network perspective. Um, trying to optimize that and get the latency and throughput uh, as high and low as possible. Um, previously, I worked at a, a satellite communications company where we built out um, something similar where it was high throughput uh, GPU and NIC uh, solution where um, we solved some of the problems that we're going to talk about today using an alternative method. Thank you very much. Uh, Alexei? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Alexey Pirovarov. I work in the Advanced Software Technology Lab of Huawei, Russia Research Institute, Moscow. I have been working on supporting performance critical application in orchestrators like Kubernetes. I'm working on it and on OpenStack in the past. I'm mostly focusing on barometer deployments. My scope is covered by deployment, security hardening, and any other use cases for multi-tenant scenarios. Thank you very much. My name is Gergely Chatari, and I'm working in the Open Source Program Office of, of Nokia. And as we are a telecom uh, vendor, we are interested in running our workloads in, in, uh, in, in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And of course, some of our workloads are, are performance sensitive. This is why we are interested in in this effort, and we are supporting the effort with uh, with uh, with require requirements and uh, let's say technical consultancy. Uh, let's jump to the technical details, and I would like ask you, Swati, to explain a bit uh, the solution space of this problem. Sure. 
So Kubernetes has become the de facto standard for container orchestration, and it's attracting performance sensitive workloads that are very demanding and need the speed and raw performance as if running directly on bare metal. In the diagram here, you can see an example of a Kubernetes cluster where we have master node, where, where the control plane components like API server and scheduler are running. And then we have two worker nodes. Each node is running kubelet, which is the node agent. It communicates with the control plane and make sure that the containers are running in a pod. To create a pod, kubelet needs a container on time, which is responsible for running containers. Uh, Kubernetes supports several container runtimes like Docker, Containerd, Cryo, and any implementation of Kubernetes CRI, which stands for the Container Runtime Interface. Then we have, of course, the hardware, the underlying hardware. Um, our aim to enable Kubernetes is to, um, or sorry, our aim to enable um, in Kubernetes is the support for resource management for next generation workloads on the underlying heterogeneous hardware. In order to achieve this goal, we need to tackle this problem at various layers. We need to solve various problems at cluster level, node level, runtime, and the hardware level. There are a few key questions that need to be addressed. Um, how do we make sure that at a cluster level, the scheduler is able to make placement decisions, not merely by taking the amount of requested and available resources on a node, but also taking into consideration the underlying topology of those resources. At a node level, how do we ensure that resources such as CPUs, memory, PCI devices are aligned for optimal performance? And then there are optimizations at runtime and the hardware level that we need to be able to leverage for low latency and high throughput applications. Um, then the other aspect of this is um, at some layers, we have the ability to create custom plugins to alter the default behavior. However, in the other layers, we cannot do that. Therefore, to solve some of these problems, we need to create plugins, uh, whereas for the others, we need to enhance the core of Kubernetes itself. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a very interesting and, and several component uh, problem, and, uh, and uh, it's an interesting question how the the members of this group are, are collaborating together and and how uh, is this whole problem space is not solved in, in a Kubernetes SIG or a CNCF tag. Uh, Alexei, can you tell us some words about that? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, Kubernetes SIG, such as uh, SIG node, is responsible for everything related to uh, worker nodes uh, and um, the various uh, other SIGs in uh, Kubernetes community, like SIG scheduling. Uh, this uh, SIG is, is responsible for everything related to Cube scheduler. Uh, for example, CNCF uh, tech uh, covers mostly runtime. Uh, such a, as a CCRI, a container runtime interface, or uh, OCI, Open Container Initiative Specification. Uh, but before proposing something in those six, uh, the group of uh, involved people gathers uh, together and tries to work out a common solution, uh, try to find common requirements. Uh, the communication occurs in Slack, uh, sometimes by video call conference or in Google Groups, when we are gathering together and discussing issues uh, or making a brainstorm. And, but Signal meeting is not the best place for brainstorming, and much better to meet before uh, to prepare slides and then go to Signal to be sure we found a solution which satisfies our general requirements. Thank you very much. And now uh, we, we've, we are talking about the requirements of next generation performance sensitive workloads, but what are these requirements exactly? Sasha, can you explain that? Well, first of all, I need to say what those requirements are unique to each workload. And uh, everybody in the space who are using Kubernetes for uh, web workloads, we have uh, probably different meaning of that. So if you have a compute workload with uh, like high demand on CPU time, most probably what you really need is uh, exclusive core or set of cores allocation and exclusive usage of a cache. So to, to reduce the disturbance from other processes. 
If you have memory intensive application, you need to have a good alignment, not only on the CPU, but also memory controllers. And then probably you need to optimize how, how it's allocated. If you have some devices, let's assume like the 5G network, where you have um, strict requirements about latency, about bandwidth, about the um, ability to process the packets in predictable time, when you need to have uh, even more complex setup where you have like the CPU, the caches, the input output lanes, the PCI devices, like network cards and so on, all of them, uh, set as an exact pipeline which define, uh, which delivers the optimal performance for your particular setup. And as example, Cliff actually mentioned what he in his previous company uh, worked on something similar. And I would like to pass the uh, message to, to Cliff. Cliff, can you explain like what kind of complex setup you had in the past? Sure. Thanks. So a couple of years back um, in my previous company, we were working on an NFV style application where we had uh, many hundred gig NICs, uh, network interface cards in a node, uh, many GPUs in a node uh, and a dual socket system. So it's a, it's a fairly common type of system when you're looking at uh, NFV or accelerator applications. Um, and we had it containerized already. So the way that we were deploying it before was in Kubernetes, we would manually specify which resources we needed in the pod spec um, and the, the pod itself would go consume those resources. And this was very difficult to maintain because every time you wanted to deploy something, you had to specify exactly uh, to the pod what it should claim when it started up. So it obviously wasn't scalable and it, it wasn't uh, packing as many pods on the nodes as possible. Uh, so we looked at our node architecture, which is similar to the one shown here. Um, at the very bottom, we have the CPU, or in this case, it was uh, it was one NUMA node per CPU, and it was a dual socket system, so you had two NUMA nodes on there. And then in the purple and the kind of teal color, uh, that's to indicate the hyper-threaded cores. So you have a, a, a core and a sibling core that are paired together and affect each other in, in performance to some extent. Um, then above that, you have the PCI topology, which is where all of your devices are connected. So in this case, we had GPUs and, uh, and NICs. And in this particular case, I'm showing a GPU and a NIC connected to a particular PCI switch. And then there's a tree of those going down to the actual CPUs themselves. Um, and then at the very top there is the backplane for the GPUs. So in this case, I'm drawing it to uh, one GPU to one GPU, but it could be an all to all. There's many different configurations that it can be. And then annotated in the text is the actual uh, rough throughput of each of these links. And so you could see down at the bottom, uh, you have about 30 gigabytes per second for the inner processor link. And then on the way up, you get uh, 20 to 150 gigabytes per second. Now, if you were to schedule a workload naively and place it on any GPU and any NIC, there's a high probability that that traffic from the GPU and the NIC will go back through that inner processor link, which you want to avoid because it would be a big bottleneck if you compare aggregating all those 20 gigabyte per second links at the top. Um, and really what we wanted was we had a NIC which was feeding 100 gigabits of data into a GPU streaming, processing that data and then sending it back out. So you really didn't want the data going through that inner processor link, but you also didn't want it going through the second PCI switch in that tree either, because that means that you have a, um, a bottleneck with the other two GPUs and NICs that are also going through that switch. So what we ended up doing, we looked at the Kubernetes landscape, um, and at the time, Kubernetes, the main way that we could solve this was Kubernetes had a way to plug into the scheduler. And so all this meant was that uh, if you wanted to run your own scheduler, Kubernetes, when you launched your pod, Kubernetes would hand off the entire scheduling process to your pod, to your scheduler rather. So we built a custom scheduler that we called NHD um, that handles all these scenarios. So it's hyper-threading aware, it's PCI switch aware. Um, it handles huge pages, which are not shown here, but those would be the, the memory aspect of it. Um, it handles, handles NUMA awareness. So that's the part that uh, Sasha touched on a little bit. So it's, it's kind of handling our extreme case where we needed to pair up these GPUs and NICs. Now, the big downside is that since it is a custom scheduler and it was back at that time, there were no easy ways to plug into the scheduler. 
it mean that it meant that we had to take on the entire scheduling process ourselves, which was a, a a big pain because we didn't get any of the benefits that the scheduler already had, such as knowing how much disk space is available on the node. We would have to do all that stuff ourselves, and we did to some extent, um, kind of reinvent the wheel. Uh, that since then that has changed quite a bit, and uh, they'll talk about that later in some of the upcoming slides. Um, this project is open source. If anyone wants to go look at the code or use it, uh, the URL is right there and uh, feel free to ask questions at the end as well. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we, we, we saw um, how this problem can be solved with the, with the custom scheduler, but uh, the question now is how can we solve it in the different layers of, uh, of the Kubernetes ecosystem where we have the runtime and hardware level, we have the node level and we have the, the scheduler level and all of these, these levels needs to work together and all of these layers have different kind of, of gaps what we need to, to close. So Swati, can you tell us something about uh, the, the gaps in the scheduler layer? Sure. Uh, so I touched this on my intro. So when this, uh, while making the scheduling decision, the Kubernetes scheduler looks at the amount of requested resources and determine the node that is uh, that can fulfill that resource requirement. But it doesn't consider the topology manager policy on that node or whether or not those resources can fit on the same NUMA node. So essentially scheduler lacks visibility into resources available on a per NUMA basis, which can lead to unpredictable application performance. At a node level, topology manager coordinates the topology of resource allocation of CPUs, memories, devices, and uh, helps to extra extract the best performance out of the underlying hardware. However, in scenarios where topology manager is unable to align topology of requested resources um, based on the configured policy, the pod is rejected with topology affinity error. And if the pod is part of a deployment or a replica set, it results in runaway pod creation because the subsequent pod that is created ends up with a topology affinity error as well. So in order to optimize cluster-wide performance of workloads, resource utilization, enhance the overall performance of system as a whole, the default scheduler should consider the resource availability along with underlying resource topology to increase the likelihood of a pod to land on a node where it can fit. So essentially what we are doing to solve this problem, um, we, are, what, we are introducing a few components. And um, in addition to that, we are making enhancements to some of the existing ones. So uh, there are two pieces to, puzz to this puzzle essentially. So one is a component that exposes resource information along with granularity of NUMA node. And then there's the scheduling piece where we have to enhance the scheduling process to take that information into consideration to make a proper scheduling decision. So as I mentioned, the first piece of the puzzle is uh, node feature discovery, which is often referred to as NFD. It is a project that is part of Kubernetes SIG repo. NFD is a node fleecing agent which exposes hardware capability in the form of node labels, annotations, extended resources. We are adding a software component called NFD topology updater, as you can see in the diagram, that collects information about the resources allocated to running pods, along with the associated topology information using pod resource API to determine the available resources with NUMA node granularity. And then we expose this information as CR instances per node. Um, let's talk a bit maybe about the pod resource API, because I guess not everyone would be familiar with that. It's a kubelet endpoint for pod resource assignment, and we enhanced it to add support for exposing CPU IDs and device topology information. Um, and the other thing that we added as part of this was uh, additional endpoint to obtain information of allocatable resources. Um, then the second piece, as I mentioned, is the topology where scheduler plugin. Again, Kubernetes SIG repo uh, houses a repository for out of free scheduler plugins, which, uh, which are based on the scheduler framework. And we contributed uh, node resource topology scheduler plugin there. Uh, this uses the CRs created by NFD to make a NUMA where placement decision. Essentially what it does is it runs a simplified version of the topology manager alignment algorithm to determine if a node is suitable to assign the part to a particular node. Um, then the, there's a glue between these two components, which is the node resource topology API. 
that is a CRD API, which uh, which essentially is used by these two different components, NFG and the scheduler plugin. Uh, an important thing to note here is that Topology Manager still runs its alignment logic at a node level for resource allocation. Um, and, and the scheduler plugin essentially ensures that the scheduling process takes place and the, node, the part is assigned to the right node. Um, now that we've kind of understood the challenges at the cluster and scheduling level, um, Alexi, could you please share with us how resource management looks like at a node level and what are the gaps uh, that you see in at, uh, at Kubelet and node level? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, we need to list every component in Kubelet uh, which are important for high performance critical workloads. Uh, such components like topology manager, CPU manager, device manager and memory manager. Each has its own responsibility. The topology manager is responsible for aligning resources via Numa node. The CPU manager is responsible for exclusive CPU allocation. As you already said, a device manager registers the set of device plugins. You can see it on the picture and uh, provides the uh, resources uh, which have a name of uh, extended resources to the cluster level. Also, if a device plugin provides a uh, normal quality of device inappropriate resource, in this case, the device manager could help the project manager to align device on the same normal node where CPUs were exclusively allocated by CPU manager, uh, a particular uh, container. Uh, the latest component is memory manager. It also helps to guarantee normal alignment, but uh, now alignment of memory. Uh, before memory manager was introduced, we had to rely on Linux kernel or organize huge term BFS mount points. Uh, in other words, uh, we did it manually. Uh, let's describe the project manager in details. Uh, it uses other manager uh, which implement uh, hint providers interface, CPU manager, device manager, and memory manager uh, implement this interface. A bitmap of the possible normal allocation is provided by hint providers interface. The project manager implements uh, different policies. The most important policy for high performance critical workloads is single NUMA node policy. This policy guarantees to allocate all resources from the same NUMA node or raise the point affinity hero if it's not possible. Uh, yes, uh, Swati, you already thought about it. Uh, last year, the scope parameter was added into the point manager. As we know, Kubernetes tracks a resources via container and the point manager's policy also applied its policies via container. For example, in case of single NUMA policy, it could be a uh, uh, situation when two containers from one port are correctly placed in different NUMA nodes. Yes, correctly in different NUMA nodes. It could affect application uh, performance. And those uh, containers, uh, uh, for example, if we have those containers uh, active interaction through memory, like DB application, uh, we have to clarify until memory manager was introduced, it was 100%, it was not 100% true. So the idea was to introduce behavior to apply policies per ports, not per container. Uh, for this purpose, the Ponger manager scope uh, Kubernetes option was introduced. The port value for this option means to apply the Ponger manager policy per port resources when the container value of the option is a default um, behavior as it was before. So in this case, any resources of all containers of a particular uh, port will be in the same number node. Of course, if single number node policy is enabled on the node. Uh, to have exclusively allocated the CPU, the static policy of CPU manager should be selected by Kubelet configuration or by Kubelet command line option. The hybrid trade that CPUs and chips with crystals of last level caches out of the scope uh, now. But recently, uh, this year, a CPU manager policy option was introduced 
which aims to allocate all the course view from the same physical course, but many other use cases are not supported yet. So let's move to device plugins. As you can see, um, device plugins are working outside of the Kubelet. Uh, nowadays, there are a lot of device plugins, most popular are SROV uh, device plugins into or on the network appointment working group, uh, maintainability. Also, NVIDIA GPU device or plugins uh, very popular device plugin. So um, before the device manager, this problem was solved by APAC integer resource. In that time, for example, not a feature discovery provided APAC integer resources, uh, for example, for SRIV, but APAC integer resources was replaced by extended resources. Now it's a history. Uh, briefly, uh, the memory manager calculates the power hints for a container and graduated quality of service port for conventional memory and huge pages of all sizes. The power hint represents a possible set of normal nodes that has enough capacity to satisfy containers' memory demand for all uh, uh, memory types. Before the memory manager, we had to rely on the Linux kernel or organize a uh, huge uh, BFS mount points. It was the current situation, uh, George Lee, uh, Your next question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Sasha, can you tell us something about the, the lower, la lower layers? So how the, the runtime and hardware layer is, is, uh, is organized? Yeah, well, thanks for asking. So um, I would like to complicate the picture a bit more compared to what Swati and Alexei explained. So yes, we have right now in the upstream Kubernetes uh, set of uh, CPU memory managers, topology manager. All of these try to solve the most common setup like and the most simplif uh, simplified architecture of, of a system. So like you have one socket which equal to one NUMA node, which consists of some CPUs and some memory. And uh, assumption also what this socket has only one single IO bus. Reality a bit more complex. Even with hardware, which is released in past several years, we have scenarios what like cores might be different. We have different performance or power settings. The caches might be different on those. The uh, socket might have several NUMA nodes where control, memory controllers are working in different mode. You can have multiple uh, PCI buses. So some cores are closer to PCI bus, some, some are further. Uh, you have different types of memory uh, where uh, these different types actually means different performance uh, or like bandwidth or latency of accessing this memory. And none of those hardware details is actually uh, visible to the kubelet because the kubelet and the overall Kubernetes was built on the promise of being uh, hardware agnostic. And uh, the, the things what, what we have is trying to simplify the task for most common problem, for most common hardware, but it lacks the, uh, all the flexibility for custom solutions. And this is where we need to look a bit deeper. So what we can do on, on other layers. Of course, there are some solutions which tries to hide that complexity by uh, hypervisor. So for example, like VMware Tanzu, it tries to optimize the hardware uh, placement of a virtual uh, kubelet node uh, transparently. But if you're talking about some other deployment, like either cloud or bare metal, we have not that many uh, pieces where we can plug it. So we have between the actual hardware and Linux kernel, uh, two boxes. One is CRI runtimes, and luckily there are practically two projects, uh, most active Cryo and Container D. And when we have actual OCI runtimes, and with OCI runtimes, we know how to operate with a kernel, with uh, actual hardware knobs what kernel provides. 
But as we have these several layers of uh, abstractions, like CRI, OCI, and, and so on, it means what like low levels can uh, modify the parameters more actively, but we are not exposing all the knobs. Same, same losses between the CRI and, and the Kubelet. Kubelet evolved from the uh, old times when we had a Docker shim. So the Kubelet CRI interface is partially declarative. So it describes what needs to be run, but when it's partially uh, imperative. So uh, all this detection or creation of the C groups, some of the C group setting is dictated by the kubelet directly to runtime. And while we had only run C, it was okay. But nowadays we have the VM-based runtimes like Kata containers, GVisor, and so on. So as soon as we start to use those like micro VMs, some of the assumptions about like what actually NUMA node, for example, means is not exactly the true. So we looked at uh, different means how to extend that. Like obviously you can have a custom OCI runtime, but you are limited of what you can do there. And when we looked at the CRI runtimes, Cryon Container D, and about a year ago, one of the maintainer of Container D introduced it to a project which is called NRI, Node Resource Interface. At the time of introduction, this project was very simplistic. So it um, utilizes the idea of CNI uh, plugin. So something what can be executed on the start of a container and it can alter some of the properties of a uh, newly created container. But if you really want to utilize all the flexibility what hardware provides, and if you really want to have a plugins what knows about details of your hardware, uh, you need to have something more flexible. And right now, uh, our team plus a few other people from the community, we are working on improving uh, this NRI interface to be flexible so we can hook into all life cycle for containers. It should be uh, easy to deploy those plugins. And we would like to make it interoperable between those two major uh, container runtimes. So this, uh, tries to solve the flexibility uh, to the level what you can have a custom installation with custom resource policies, tailor it for your hard hardware needs and easy extension points for all the control of resources. Thank you very much. Uh, and Let's let's uh, let me ask back to to Alexei uh, for a minute. So, uh, are there any work uh, in the built-in resource management at the moment? Yes, right. Uh, right now, we find out uh, that there is a external resource management. Sasha told uh, about it, uh, but the work in internal and in built-in components. Uh, are still in progress. Uh, uh, so there is an enhancement proposal regarding last level caches, but it's still in review, so you can contribute, uh, you can participate in reviewing and in, in implementation. Enhancement proposal for changing CPU uh, distribution among sockets and cores is also on review. Uh, Port Resource API also evolves. Additional features related to the PONG are on the way and changes are coming up for new version of uh, Border Resources Interface. Uh, so, uh, George? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to drop the bar back to you and ask you about like how, how the, the requirements from internal company projects and requirements from open source projects are, are, are synchronized in, in, in your case, because we are working, all of us are, are working for a company and the company has, has a set of targets while the open source projects have a, have a different uh, target. So how, how is it working for, for you, for example, let's say? Uh, so yes, uh, all of us are working on different products for different purposes and different companies, but we are trying to find uh, 
a way to implement components in a common way and be useful for more and more use cases as possible. Sometimes it's not possible. As Alexander mentioned, we have a lot of use cases, a lot of hardware architectures and uh, uh, renderers. So also, we are trying to reach a maintainability of our products uh, inside the company, as well as community cord. So let's imagine uh, we have rewrote the whole CPU manager policy, but we are still calling low level functions in Kubernetes. And still, we are being invoked by our own components. And once we are moving from one version to another uh, version of Kubernetes, we have to adopt our code. And it's a huge maintainability burden uh, since uh, function prototypes and interface are changing continuously in upstream uh, version. From my point of view, the way to keep the balance is developing sustainable interfaces. And this way, different components may implement different uh, different companies may implement different components as it was done for, for example, for device plugins or different runtimes uh, implementation. And all components will communicate with each other maybe without a problem. So, George, only. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in really fast uh, on that question also. Um, I think one of the important things here is that as long as the building blocks are there and out there and documented, it makes it easier for companies to come in that are looking for, you know, building their own solution around something like this and figuring out how they can or can't use what's what's out there to do it. So a good example of, of that was NFT that uh, Swati mentioned, the node feature discovery. That was used heavily in our scheduler because it, it we needed to leverage a whole bunch of the features that NFT had and we didn't want to uh, to build our own. But in addition to that, NFT allowed extensions that if you needed to add custom user data, that maybe wasn't something that was built into NFT, but you had other pieces of topology awareness that you needed to add, uh, you could. And then in turn, you could go back and upstream that if it seemed appropriate for other companies to use as well. So I think it, it just takes time and there's, there's a lot of different requirements and use cases coming in. Um, but as more and more come in, we're seeing all these pieces kind of come together uh, in a way that is, I think, general enough where you can build pretty much anything off of off of this in the future. Thank you very much. And now, like we, we saw that like, there are lots of uh, things happened already. There are lots of uh, changes happened in 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 these components, and there are lots of changes still happening. But uh, what do you think? Uh, what what will happen next? So what's what are the next step, uh, Sasha? Well, my simple answer to it, what's next, means uh, actually a lot of work. And as you mentioned, all of those components are still in development. There are uh, a lot of things what can be done for, for scheduler part, for enhancing the internal resource model inside Kublet. Uh, obviously, a lot of work in runtime space, uh, a lot of uh, understanding how the future generations of the hardware will be affecting the workloads. And even with the workloads itself, we need to understand what like the wor workloads itself evolved. If a few years back, we're just running like the databases, today we have the application plus side containers, uh, like service meshes and so on and so forth. All of this includes the implications of how resources needs to be managed. And from our perspective, even we are like in the Kublet, we are trying to uh, solve the most common problems and we are different plugin mechanism. We are giving you a flexibility. We as a community still wants to understand what kind of workloads you have, what kind of uh, problems you are trying to solve, what kind of requirements you have, what kind of maybe internal solutions you had. And all of this information helps us to, uh, first of all, to develop, with the things what we already planned, plan the new things uh, for those components, define the APIs better, and even like catching the bugs by trying what we already created. All, all of kind of with feedbacks for our work um, is uh, really appreciated. And if you're going to contribute, it's even more appreciated. 
as I'm hooking to that, let me just uh, list all the, the forums where, where you can connect to, to us, to the, to the members of, of, of this group. So first of all, there is, a, there is Signode, which is, a, which is a Kubernetes SIG. And of course, you can, you can access uh, the Signode discussions on the, on the Signode uh, channel in, in Slack or in the uh, regular meeting. Of, of the SIG node or in the Google Groups um, discussion forums of, of the SIG. Also, there is a, a topology of our scheduling uh, Slack channel uh, in the Kubernetes Slack about this particular problem where you can uh, discuss with us and, 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 and uh, try to help us. And also there is a, on the CNCF level, uh, uh, tag for for runtimes under the the tag runtime channel of the of the CNCS Slack. So if anybody is interested in in uh, in joining to this work, uh, please join us because there is a lot of uh, work to do, and we need um, all the help that you can provide us. And with this, uh, I would like to give you the opportunity to ask questions in the in the meeting platform. We are doing everything to be there and answer your questions. So thank you so much for joining our session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.